Church, good to see you. And thank you, Cameron and Erica and Gid and Tom uh, for the music. Uh, we didn't say it, but, uh, and maybe he doesn't even need an introduction because uh, we love uh, Cameron and Erica, but we're so glad to have you all back, brother. Thank, so thankful you come and uh, serve us and uh, lead us to the throne even as you had. So we're, uh, we're grateful. Uh, my name is Michael White. If you don't know, um, if, I had a, if, I, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, I hope we can remedy that soon, but uh, I get to serve as the lead pastor here, uh, do most of the preaching and teaching. Uh, as, as Andrew said earlier, we're a church led by a plurality of guys, and so we, we distribute that leadership load. Uh, fortunately, this church doesn't rise or fall on my shoulders, because that would be a very bad thing indeed. And so God is gracious the way he lays it out in the scriptures uh, to spread out responsibility over a number of uh, God-called, uh, scripture-qualified men. And so uh, it's a joy to, uh, to do this uh, work here. Uh, we're going to be in Ezra 3, if you want to just begin turning there. Ezra's uh, in the Old Testament. If you get to the book of Psalms, kind of in the middle of your Bible, and just kind of go forward uh, through Job and uh, Nehemiah, you'll, uh, you'll, Esther, you'll, you'll, you'll find it eventually. So, uh, so, so I'll give you a head start on that if you need, uh, if you need help. So, so change uh, is inevitable, right? It's a part of life, and uh, different ones of us like, like change more than others probably. But it's always a sad thing when a favorite store or favorite restaurant goes out of business, right? You know, like here in Lincolnton, for example, I was just thinking about this. F- future generations will never have the experience of having a setup from its grill, right? Some of you remember that place. I don't think I actually made it there. Uh, I remember it. I remember seeing it, but, uh, but I never actually made it there before uh, it closed. But, but what's even more sad than, than that, like something closing and, and, and never coming back, might, might be this. It might be when something closes and then it it doesn't really just close. It, it kind of goes out of business, but then it reopens as a former sh- a shell of its former self. You know what I'm talking about? And there's lots of places that we can think about and talk about, but, but the, uh, the one in consultation with, uh, with a fellow elder uh, that I thought of was uh, uh, Long Creek Fish Fry. You guys know Long Creek Fish Fry, some of you? Uh, if you? If you don't, it's a, it's a little place um, that since the time of Harry Truman uh, was president, since his presidential administration, they had been serving fried fish Um, at this little restaurant on the lower end of uh, of the Dallas Highway down in Gaston County, maybe 25 minutes or so from here. Uh, They've been serving uh, fried fish in large quantities um, to lots and lots and lots of people. And the building, the building was nothing special to look at. Um, (laughs) The parking lot, when it was busy, could be a little interesting to navigate. Um, you go inside the restaurant, there wasn't much in the way of ambiance, uh, you know, it had glossy pine paneling, um, covering all the walls, um, which maybe that's your thing, but, uh, yeah, um, big wooden, uh, big wooden booths, right, to sit in, and it was a fish camp, right, so, and those of you, you know, from local culture, you understand what a fish camp is, like, it's not a place that you're going to go on a romantic date, and if it is, then, uh, brother, you must, you must have a good woman, if that's, if that's a, her idea of a romantic date, um, but you go there because you want to eat fish and eat lots of it, right? That's why you go to a fish camp. And even Freedom had a, had a our, the men of Freedom Church had a, had a bit of a tradition going. Um, basically, it, it would sell itself, right? You would say, hey, let's, go, let's all go together and eat fish. And 30, 35 people would show up and we'd go down there and uh, get together at a bunch of tables and we would enjoy ourselves. We'd eat lots of good food uh, with lots of good brothers. And it was really good times. But... But things change. And some sort of family dispute when grandma passed away meant that the, the, owner, the owner of the restaurant didn't own the building. And so there was some sort of dispute and uh, he had to basically move. And so what he did, he was either, he was either close down or move. And so, so he, uh, he decided he would move. So he moved up the road just a little bit. And now Long Creek Fish Fry, while the sign is the same, maybe the food is the same, I don't even know. Long Creek Fish Fry, at least in my estimation, is not the same, right? It's not the same because the glory of those nights when we would go down and dwell in those pine paneled walls, right, and eat lots of fish together is gone. It's no more. And, and I'm sure some people, and maybe even here, like some of you are just rejoicing in the fact that, no, we can still go get the fish. And that's what's important, right? Right? It continues to exist, and so this is a good thing. But for some of the older timers, it's still not the same. Well, th- this morning, as we continue our series in the book of Ezra, we're going to run into something that, that's, that's similar to that. Uh, the title of this sermon series is From Ruin to Restoration. 
And, and that's really what we're seeing unfold in the, in the pages of the, the story of the book of Ezra. God's people have returned to the promised land after the exile. They've been disobedient to God. They've been sent away from the land, living in exile for about 70 years. And now God's people have returned to the promised land. And they're, they're resettling the land. They're rebuilding the temple. They're restarting their lives. And this is all just an incredible, great, glorious work of God. But... But as as great as that is, and as much joy as that brings, there's also mixed with that this tinge of sorrow, because things are not what they once were, and things will never be what they once were. And so even though we, as we gather as God's people, God's church this morning, even though we're separated by many, many centuries from those ancient Jews who are resettling this land, We, in fact, even as Cameron alluded to just a second ago, we, in fact, experience this similar reality. We live between this already and not yet. The kingdom of God has already come, and yet the the not yet, what will be revealed, is yet out there. And so we live out our faith in a world that is still fallen. In a world where sin still happens, and it has its consequences. And, and God redeems and restores, and that's true, and that's wonderful, and yet, and yet, in the middle of that, things are not as they should be. And so here's what I want you to see today as we, as we run through this text. The main thing I want you to see is that God restores, and so you can circle that, asterisk that, I'm, I'm not trying to undercut that, but I'm just trying to bring a dose of reality with that. God restores, but the sting of brokenness in this life it often lingers. And so let's jump into our text. We'll, we'll see that theme uh, played out. Uh, so let me pray um, as, we, uh, as we do that. Actually, let me, read, let me go ahead and read the text, and, uh, and then we'll pray at the conclusion of that. So here now, this is Ezra uh, chapter 3. Uh, we'll read the whole chapter here in one, uh, in one shot. So here, so here goes, Ezra 3. When, when the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man in Jerusalem. And then arose Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it's written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booze, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings of the new moon, and all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. For the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. And so they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and Tyrians to to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now in the second year, after the coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, they made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Hinnadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' houses, old men, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. 
so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we come, again, separated uh, so, by, by so many years from these events, and yet still living very similarly in many ways. And so, Lord, would you, by your Spirit, Lord, I pray that you would help us to make those connections. Lord, would you help us to, to think about our lives in the midst of this already and not yet, even as we long for the day that you will appear and make things right. And so would you even use your word this morning to strengthen us, to give us hope and encourage perseverance, Lord, to endure and to thrive even as we wait. And we pray you would do things for the, these things for the good of your church and for the good ultimately of your kingdom and its advance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we, as we walk through this text, there's basically three things that, that stand out that I want to just call our attention to. So the first is this. The first is, is the priority of worship. The priority of, of worship. If, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, we looked at that long list of names, right, in Ezra chapter 2, uh, names and numbers, and, and we saw that something like 10% of the people that went to resettle the land were, were either, were there, there were people who were associated with the temple in some way. Or you had priests, you had Levites, you had other uh, servants that were there to help uh, just kind of do manual labor in association with the temple. And so it just reminds us that as the people were going back to resettle the land, they, they were going forward with a particular vision and a mission. A- after years of false worship, well, when they were in the land the first time, after years of false worship, eventually led to their eviction from the land, and that's why they went into exile. As they're now returning and coming back, they're focused on getting it right. They want to reinstitute, reinstitute worship. They want to, to focus on serving God faithfully. and this, like, They just don't want to repeat the same mistakes. And, and so that, that's why verse 1 kind of starts where it does. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in the towns. The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. The, the seventh month would have been the month of uh, Tishri, um, which kind of basically is the equivalent of our uh, September and October, uh, moves around on the lunar calendar just a little bit, but September, October. And so in, in many ways, this month was the, the highlight, the climax of the Jewish year, um, because there are a number of festivals that are uh, laid out in the book of Leviticus, especially Leviticus chapter 23, that's laying out these festivals and feasts that they should be having. And so in the seventh month, um, it was, that was the same month, actually, that Solomon had gathered the people to dedicate the first temple. So there's lots of overtones and connections here um, between the first temple and now this start to, to rebuild the second temple. Um, and so it was, it was an appropriate time for them to gather together in this seventh month. They, they'd made it back home, and they, you know, they hadn't even hardly, you know, probably gotten comfortable yet. And yet it was time to go up to Jerusalem to worship God. Just understand and and notice this was a priority for them. It was a priority for them to come together and to worship God. They just got back into town. They've been out for 70 years, and so there's lots of work to be done, right? Homes to rebuilt, uh, fields to be cleaned out uh, and prepped for uh, for next year's planting. Uh, There were businesses that uh, that needed to be started and and work that needed to be done. I mean, and y'all know how it is when you move, right? Like, that's just work, and awful, right? It's just, it's one of the worst things ever to try to be out unsettled and try to kind of make a fresh start. And so that's what they are doing here. And yet, what was so important to them in the middle of all that? They pulled away from all the things that needed to get done to do the thing that was of utmost importance, to gather together, to worship the people, uh, or to worship as the people of God. It's a great example for us because we too live in a distracted age, right? There's so many things that that compete for our attention that constantly call us away from this worship gathering. And the bottom line is that just like them, we must value and prioritize this time, right? There's always going to be competition, right? Sleep is always a competitor, right, for waking up on a Sunday morning. Kids and all the things that we have going on with them, sporting events and different things, just the pull in the sense that we should really spend some time as a family. We just need to relax. And so we've got to decide, is this important to us? Notice too that the text says that they gathered as one man, as one man. The the people were unified as they were gathering here. Um, 
we, we know from chapter 2 that there were around 42,000 of them that were resettling. And, and surely among 42,000 people, right, there were some different opinions, right? Different ideas, different preferences, right? I mean, even in a room this size, right? We're all going to go someplace different for, for lunch or do something different, right? Um, and you've got your life and we've got ours, and, and, and that's a good thing. But in the midst of all of that diversity, that didn't undercut their unity, right? They were coming together with a common faith and a common purpose, committed to worshiping the Lord their God and seeking to obey Him. And it's the same thing we're trying to do here at Freedom. Uh, we understand that, that this isn't a church that is uh, run by us and then therefore ultimately for us, meaning us here, right? That's not why we exist. This is a church that is run and exists ultimately by God and ultimately for God. We exist by his grace and for his great glory. And so in the midst of all sorts of diversity, the, the unity of the gospel is what holds us together the unity of the mission to see lives transformed by God through the gospel for his glory. That's what unites us together, that he would accomplish his good purposes through us. And so as they're gathering together with that great unity, then we see this. Then arose, verse 2, Jeshua, the son of Josedach, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of God in Israel. And so just to, again, remind you of some of these names, these characters. So, so Jeshua there, he is the, um, the grandson of the last functioning high priest. All right, so from back uh, several generations before now. And so that's who he is, acting as the, as the high priest. Zerubbabel is the grandson of the next to last king of Judah. And so again, he's a, a natural leader. Uh, acting in a, in a way as, as the governor of, uh, of, this, uh, of this place. And so, um, just, to, just to, to keep going, they built this altar to God to offer burnt offerings on it, as it's written in the law of Moses, the man of God, and then they set the altar in its place. Because fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And so, here was what was going on. Rebuilding the temple, that was going to take... A significant amount of time and we'll even see next week as some opposition comes it's going to take a, a very long time to to do that and so the first priority was listen if we can't just build a temple back in a day let's build an altar so that worship can continue think about that they hadn't offered burnt offerings in 70 some years right and without the shedding of blood there's not the remission of sin like this was what was prescribed for them to have a right relationship with god there had been no offerings there had been no sacrifices and so finally, they're, they're prioritizing this. They're building an altar so that they can worship the Lord as they ought. That's a common theme in the, in the Old Testament. The, one of the first things you do is you build an altar. Noah, fresh off of the ark, he builds an altar. Abraham, he arrives in the land. Well, he, he builds an altar. Moses, as he's leading the people in the wilderness, well, he builds an altar. David, before there was a temple David built an altar, even on this very spot that they are st establishing this altar. And that's what the, the verse means when it says that they set the altar in its place. They're putting it right where it belonged, right where God back in, in David's generation and Solomon's generation had specified where to build the temple and where to set the altar. They're rebuilding it right there in that spot. And look what's motivating them. For fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. See, understand the land was not uninhabited and, and desolate. There's still people who were around. And again, we'll, we'll see the resistance that comes from the people that were there and kind of had made their home in the absence of these exiles. And so in spite of having a decree by mighty King Cyrus that they could go back and rebuild the temple and in spite of the fact that God was with them and was leading them to do that, there were still threats to their security. Still wasn't an easy prospect. This wasn't a cakewalk. And what's encouraging is, is what they did when they saw that, when they saw the, the opposition as they were fearful in their hearts. What did that do? Well, they ran to God with their fear. They said, listen, we need to worship we needed to cry out to God that he would help us do this great work. It caused them to look away from themselves and to look to the Lord. 
They saw the people and they were afraid, and so they turned to God to worship. That's a great example for, for us. Uh, moving forward more quickly, the, the thing that, that stands out in the rest of this kind of first section is just how determined the people were, how careful they were to obey God's word. And we've already seen this, if you, if you go back up in verse 3 there, it says that uh, they, they offered burnt offerings as it is written, actually, sorry, verse 2, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And then just kind of skim through verses 4 and 5 with me. They kept the feast of booze, notice, as it is written. And they offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as the day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, offerings of the new moon and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. And so just the, the narrator, whoever is writing this, it may be Ezra, it may be not, could be the chronicler, the person who, who wrote uh, First and Second Chronicles, uh, who's compiling these things. But whoever wrote this book is, is underscoring just their deliberate, the deliberateness with which they are seeking to obey. As it is written, they're doing everything that is required according to the rule, as they saw in the law written by Moses. You, you see that. They're worshiping God by the book. Lots of things have changed in their life, right? But this one thing hasn't. The law is their authority, and they're living by its wisdom and its rules. And so they do this even though the, the foundation of the temple hasn't been laid yet. But then all these directions and those things that, that come afterwards, again, this is all language that's evoking very specifically the language used to, to build the original temple, um, and, so, and so that's what we see in verses, uh, verse, verse 7. They're going out, they're giving money, they're seeking to acquire trees in the same way that they would have been acquired uh, back several centuries prior. And then in verses 8 and 9, we get a sense of the organization, right? You've got these leaders who are, who are delegating people in place um, to establish the work, make sure that the work goes, uh, goes well. And so they make a start on the foundation, even while the daily worship that's happening there in what will be the temple, but on the altar, even as that work continues. And so that's the first thing. Again, just the priority of these people to, to worship God. The, the second thing that stands out in this text is the pleasure of praise. The pleasure of praise. You can, you can almost hear the joy leaping off the page in these verses down in verse 10 and 11. It says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord had been laid. What, what a sweet, beautiful scene this, this is. Jubilant celebration at the faithfulness of God. They're worshiping Him again in the footprint of that place with the foundation laid and, and more will, building yet to be done. And the priests walk up, man, they are all decked out in their priestly attire, You've got the musicians tuned up. They're playing skillfully for the Lord. And the people are singing and shouting their guts out. And again, just surely this seems surreal to them, right? There were times in the not too distant past that this seemed like it would never happen when they were slaves in Babylon. And now it's happening. Psalm 137, though, describes their, their despair, the former despair. Psalm 137 says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion, the, the, the place of God, Jerusalem, his holy city. So they're weeping as they're remembering that. And then on the, on the willows there, we, we hung up our lyres there in Babylon because our captives required of us songs and our tormentors mirth. And so what they're what their captors would do is say, hey, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They were taunting them. And the people asked in desperation, how can we, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Separated from the temple, separated from the presence of God, cut off, 
But, but now, but now, here in our text, in Ezra 3, now, dear friends, they are home. <laughs> they are back. Some of them are, are seeing this for the first time, having only heard of it from their parents and their grandparents. Others, brushing back tears, we might imagine, are, are shouting and singing because the Lord has delivered and restored Jeremiah 33 was unfolding right before their eyes. What Jeremiah had said was that in this place of which you say, it's a waste with man or beast, the city of Jerusalem being leveled. In the cities of Judah, the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without a man or inhabitant or a beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And what did Jeremiah say that they were going to sing? Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God said, I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first says the Lord. And so here now, here now they are, and they are doing these very things. <laughs> They're doing these very things, proclaiming these very words. Friends, this is the great hope of God. He restores, and then we, his people, respond in praise. Friends, what a privilege it is to delight in the Lord to delight in God, to give him praise. There is no joy, there is no pleasure like it. To declare the excellencies of God, to be satisfied, to be completely content in his presence. This is what David describes in Psalm 63, the goodness of God driving him to worship. He says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. I'm thinking of the Long Creek fish fry there in particular. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. See, the goodness of God is causing him to, to respond in praise and delight. This is what we were created for, friends. This is what we will spend eternity doing declaring with loud voices, as Revelation 7 says, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a privilege, friends, to be able to do this now, to know and be known by the author and the architect of everything. And so if you struggle with that concept of, of praising God, with joy and passion. Certainly we see that right here. They're, they're shouting with a loud shout. They're singing so loud that the, the noise is heard from a long way away. Yeah, if you struggle with that when we stand to do this here as we gather, if you find your heart unmoved by the mercies of God, I just let me suggest four habits that might help stir your affections. By the way, this applies to corporate worship, but not just corporate worship. This is in our daily lives, right? Just living lives of, of praise and gratitude for God. The, the first thing, habit I would commend to you is to know your need. To know your need and to see it. These, these returning exiles here in Ezra 3, man, man, they understood. They understood their neediness. They understood that they had nothing on their own. They were coming as desperate people looking to God to fill them. And so, friend, I would just say, if you were stuck on yourself, if you think maybe that you're the man or you're the woman, then I'm just going to tell you, if, if you're believing in yourself that you'll just figure things out, then that's pride that you need to confess and repent of. The prideful person will never praise God because the prideful person is too busy praising themselves. And so you have to understand first by, under, start, start first by understanding our need for God the sinful condition of your own heart and the grace that God has shown you. Second thing is just focus on his faithfulness. Focus on his faithfulness. In the case of these exiles, right, the, the faithfulness of God was obvious. And he brought them back to the land. And it may not be as obvious in your life in that kind of 
big moment since that they can point to. But God is no less faithful towards you. He's faithful that he woke you up this morning, that he's put breath in your lungs and energy in your feet, right? His character is faithful and unfailing. His love is steadfast. Another way to to translate that that phrase, steadfast love, you see so often, uh, the Hebrew word hesed, is loyal. Loyal. He's loyal in his love towards his people. The steadfast, loyal love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. (laughs) And even if a particular circumstance in our lives doesn't go the way that we would like it to, God perseveres in his care for us as his people. We can rest and rejoice in his faithful character. So if you struggle with praise, just think about how God has been faithful to you to keep his promises, to preserve you and to sustain you in the midst of your life. Third thing is to rejoice in his redemption. To rejoice in his redemption. Here the the exiles here are experiencing this incredible physical redemption that spurs their joy. They were slaves And now they've been set free and brought back. But friends, how much greater is our joy? Because if you are here and you're a Christian, if you are in Christ, you have been liberated from the curse of eternal death. The fury of God's wrath that was aimed at you has instead been completely satisfied by Christ. He drank the fury of God's wrath down to the very last drop. And now we have been clothed with the perfect life of Jesus, our substitute. And we will live forever with God as sons and daughters in his kingdom. Guys, the news does not get any better than that. That is the redemption that God has worked for us. So if that doesn't spur you to praise, I don't know what will. Reflect on the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourself the grace he has shown you. And, And then finally, Hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. Because our experience of redemption and restoration may not be instantaneous. For 70 years, these exiles suffered in slavery. Once before, the same people group, right? For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. And friends, it may seem slow. Suffering may seem to persist and endure a long time. But God is not slow to fulfill his promises. Not one word of all the good promises of God will fail, Joshua says. And so church, we must not take this this privilege, this pleasure of praising God for granted. We must not neglect it. We must discipline ourselves to praise and give ourselves to God. But I think it's something that we often do just, yeah, take for granted. We, We just go on autopilot. When we gather to sing to him, as we walk through our life, we, we live as if our life is being accomplished by our hands and our works and our labors. And we don't realize that everything we have is a gift from him. G.K. Chesterton, the, the great British writer and thinker, once observed this. He said, the, the worst moment for an atheist is when he is really thankful and he has no one to thank. Let's think about that for a second. How sad... How sad would it be if there was nothing that existed outside of yourself? If there were no big story of which your life was a part? If the chief end of your life was to glorify and enjoy, not God, but to enjoy yourself? What a miserable life if you were the sum total of everything that was meant to happen. Friend, if you were here this morning and and you were on the fence about God, you're not sure if he exists, you're not sure if he's real, not sure if you believe this stuff, I just want you to think, are, are you really, at the end of the day, comfortable with the dreariness of that faith? And it is faith. It is faith. That's what you believe. That's what you've decided. So it's still faith. That according to scientific naturalism, right, everything we know suddenly came from virtually nothing, and that there is no purpose, no meaning, no point, except for whatever arbitrary values you decide for, to create. And they are arbitrary, friend. <laughs> if there is no God, if there is no outside moral authority, then you're just making your own rules and could just as easily make one set of rules as you could another. Don't you think, though, that there might be more? Don't you hope that there might be more? 
according to the Bible, you were created to know and to worship God. And though you rebelled and rejected the God who made you, in love, he sent his son to pay the penalty for your sin so that you could be reconciled to him. And so I get skepticism and doubt. I've been through seasons of that in my own life. But just a question. <laughs> Rather than <laughs> having such confidence in what you might think, why don't you doubt those doubts? Doubt your doubts. Be skeptical about your skepticism because they're answers if you would seek them. Friend, if you're here and you don't know Christ, I would just urge you, do not spend another day living outside the purpose for which you were created. You created to worship and to know him, to enjoy the pleasure of praise. And the third thing that stands out in this text, and it, it gets back to this, the main point we identified, it, it, it's this. The text isn't just about the priority of worship or the pleasure of praise. It, it's also about the pain of loss. It's also about the pain of loss. God restores. God restores, we said, right? But the sting of brokenness in this life often lingers and in these final verses, it really just takes a turn, kind of a strange turn as I'm reading it and studying it this week. But there's this stunning and honest contrast that's taking place in the final verses of this chapter. There is worship, right? There's worship. The people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Verse 11, right? So there's worship. But there is also weeping. It's also weeping. Many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. It won't do to, to, to think that these people are just weeping for joy, as we might say. The, the author here is intentionally making a very clear contrast, right, between those who are overcome by joy and those who are overcome with sorrow in this moment. And the question here is why, right? Why? Why is there weeping in this moment of obvious triumph, right? The, the people are there, sacrifices are being offered, the foundation is finished, and it all is onward and upward from here, right? That's the way it looks. But the reality of the situation here is a lot more muddy. For, for these priests and Levites and the heads of houses, the, the gray heads who had seen the splendor and the beauty of the first house, this occasion is not all joy. Haggai, the a prophet who was active in the same era, he suggests the reason for this kind of tension we see here. He asks in, in, uh, in Haggai 2.3, he says, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? See, he's acknowledging even as it's being built at a later period when he's writing. He's saying, look, this is, this is not the same. The reality of the situation was that even though the temple was being rebuilt, right, and even though the, the temple was using some of the same materials and, and they're going through the, the same processes, the reality is the outcome was going to be much different. This temple was not going to come close to rivaling the magnificence of Solomon's temple, probably one of the great wonders of the world with all the wealth and opulence that Solomon had. They didn't have that. I mean, Cyrus was in their corner and sent them out with gold and things, but they still didn't have the multi-million dollar building project like Solomon had. The craftsmanship, the ornateness, the grandeur, it was not going to be recaptured. And that's true historically. The Second Temple was never as... Uh, is great once it's built and as it goes on. It's never as great as the first. While, while some saw the foundation's completion here in Ezra 3 as a, as a moment of triumph, and certainly it was, right? For others, though, it only drove home to them the bitter reality, <laughs> the bitter reality that the, the, the first house was not coming back. 
And while certainly they were better off than they were when they were in Babylon, certainly God had kept his promises to restore them. At the same time, there was an incompleteness to what was happening here. And so even while they're surrounded by these loud and joyful shouts of people who are praising God, there are many who in that moment felt the pain of loss acutely. It wasn't just some of them. Right? There were enough there to make a loud sound of weeping, right? They weren't just covering up or suppressing their pain. They weren't just suffering in silence, acting all spiritual. I appreciate that, the authenticity here. No, they wept with a loud voice. Their voice was, the, the voice of the sound of their weeping was so loud that it rivaled the joyful shouts that were coming from the rest of the crowd. So you couldn't even tell the difference. Couldn't figure out which was which. Again, the noise, the collective noise of all of this was so loud it could be heard from a long way off. These people were being honest about their pain. And their pain was real. And so the question still is, is why does Ezra 3 end this way? Why is it in this way? Calling attention to this tension, not really unraveling it for us in the text? Well, a couple of reasons. For starters, I think this is a subplot in the whole book of Ezra as we read it. There's, there's restoration, and that's good and to be celebrated, but the restoration is not as great as it could be. There, there's worship, yes, but there's also weeping. The second temple, that's what Ezra's temple became known as, would never rival the first temple because that wasn't the point. The point of having an impressive place to worship God, that wasn't what the people needed. The importance of a particular place where God's presence would be centered and people would gather, that was fading away. Jesus, standing in the temple that was rebuilt on these foundations we're reading about in Ezra 3, Jesus said to those gathered, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, the Jewish leaders often didn't understand what he meant and they didn't understand in this situation. And so fortunately, the writer, the guy, the, uh, John there, uh, helps us out, clarifies Jesus was speaking not about the physical temple, but he was talking about the temple of his body. So do you understand, church, that the temple isn't about columns and masonry and gold and elaborate, ornate things. The temple is about the presence of God. That's what made it the temple. That's what made it special and important. And wherever Jesus was, the word of God, God in the flesh, that was where the temple was. A few chapters later in John's gospel, a Samaritan woman asks Jesus about the proper place of worship. She's trying to get him to weigh in on the ancient dispute between Samaritans and Jews. Where should we worship? Is it Mount Gerizim, as the Samaritans thought, or is it in Jerusalem? And Jesus doesn't even go there. He just kind of goes to the higher order question. He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, Gerizim, or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The point is not a place. The point is not a place. The point is a person. A person by whom we would access the very holy of holies in the presence of God. Second temple, the brokenness of it the incompleteness of it, the ordinariness of it is pointing to a truer and better temple. If we fast forward to Revelation 21, the writer describes the scene he sees, this great heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. He says, I saw no temple in that city. You know why? Because its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. That's the temple. The presence of God. And so the sorrow that these men are feeling in Ezra is pointing forward to the truer and better temple that's to come. The glory of the temple would not be in stone and wood, but it would be in flesh and bone. The flesh and bone of Jesus. God become man. And so I think that's why Ezra 3 is ending this way is canonically in the whole scope of Scripture to point forward to that greater reality.
But even beyond that, even connecting with us, this worship that's mixed with weeping here points to the reality of our Christian life in a fallen world. Contrary to what the the smiley TV uh, preachers with private jets will tell you, you know them, Contrary to what they will tell you, prosperity and ease are not promised to a Christian. I hate to break the news to you. Jesus is not your personal genie in a bottle, okay? That's not what Jesus does. You rub him and he gives you three wishes or something. It's not Jesus. A servant isn't greater than his master, right? And friends, what happened to the master? The master was crucified. Scripture says, even as... Cameron quoted it earlier, right? All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer, will be persecuted for our faith. That word all is important. All of us will experience a sense of loss as being followers of Christ. God's redemption of us does not eliminate suffering. Sometimes, in fact, the suffering intensifies precisely because we're following Jesus. Sometimes problems aren't taken away. Sometimes difficult people in your life don't just disappear. Sometimes the diagnosis won't be good. Sometimes the healing won't come. Sometimes the darkness, the cloud that seems to keep us oppressed won't lift. Sometimes the pain of loss and grief just don't ever really go away. The problem, friend, is not with you problem is not you. It's not that you don't have enough faith. It's not that God's mad at you. The problem is that this world is broken. Yes, he is making all things new, and that is good news. And yes, he redeems, and yes, he restores. But we will not taste the full fruits of that redemption until we are living life, walking our feet across a new heaven and a new earth. And so that's what these saints here in Ezra 3 are experiencing, this already and not yet, almost. They're grateful for the work of God, and yet they are still feeling the sting and the pain of brokenness, longing for their day when their faith would be sight, longing for the day when God will fulfill all the glorious promises that he had made. And that, friends, is how we live our lives as saints, as children of God. We walk this road together as his people, always sorrowful, Paul says, right? And yet always rejoicing, constantly weeping with those who weep, and also constantly rejoicing with those who rejoice. We bear one another's burdens. We allow the pain that lingers in this life and in our brokenness to point us to the greater restoration that awaits when he will come and we will worship him and know him and see him face to face. Wipe tears from all faces, and death will be no more, and neither will be pain or sorrow, anything anymore. God will be with us, and we'll be with him as his people, and he will be with us as our God. And until then, it's okay to not be okay sometimes, friends. It's okay. I like what D.A. Carson says. There's nothing wrong with us. None of us are suffering so bad that, that a good resurrection can't fix us, right? And we have a good resurrection that has happened and is happening, and one day we will be glorified into that. Praise God, friends. He who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. And so we move forward, sometimes crawling, sometimes step by step. And as we do, we might sing that verse of the great hymn, It is well with my soul. Lord, haste the day. Speed up the day, Lord. Hasten it that my faith will be sight. And the clouds will be rolled back like a scroll. And the trump will sound and the Lord descends. In the verse, the last line of it, even so, even so, even so, even if it's not that day yet, Until that day occurs, it is well with my soul. Because of the gospel, because of the hope of Christ, because of the body of Christ to help us walk this out together. Even so, till he comes, it is well. Let's pray. Lord, 
Thank you for so great a hope, so great a sustaining power that you put in us by your spirit. Thank you for this people of God, this community that you have set us in to walk out this lingering pain and sting of sin's death and curse together with, Lord. And so, Lord, would you help us to do that in earnestness? Lord, to be a people who rejoices with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep, not glossing it over, not saying, hey, it'll be okay, just being dismissive in that way but in earnestly contending for the joy that is before us, we will one day inherit and walk into, but also clear-eyed about the brokenness and pain and the suffering that we will yet encounter on this earth. So Lord, give us realistic hope, I pray, by the gospel. Make us your people, and even as you do that, God, would you allow the light and the hope that we have to spill over into a dark world that doesn't have that hope. Lord, that the nations would know that you are God, that they would respond in praise and worship your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.